Brad Lauer, the discipleship pastor, and it's my honor and privilege to be with you today as we study God's Word, as we dive in and, and learn more about who He is and who He wants us to be. You see, God's Word is, simply put, as I've used this illustration in other series and studies before, as my wife puts it, God's love letter to us. And in this love letter, God puts so much of Himself in those passages and in those scriptures so that we get to know Him intimately by reading and studying His Word. And then He tells us in those, in those pages and in those words and those lives what we are to do with ours. You see, um, I did, I've said this before, but I, I, I did her grandfather's funeral. And he was an old, he was in the war. He, he, was, um, he traveled a lot. And, um, and some of the, the children, my, my wife's mom and her aunt and uncles, they all had some love letters that their dad had written their mom. And so they would read, they read a few during the funeral. And in those words that were penned that we don't do as well anymore, we don't write letters, we may type or text or email, but we don't handwrite things as often as we once did. Um, it, show, it talked about how he cared for her and what his plans were that included her when he came home and, and how much he cared for her and, and all those kind of things that are just beautiful. And that's what God has done for us in the Bible. Some people call it an instruction guide or a handbook or a guidebook, which it is all that. But also, it's God revealing himself to us and confronting us with his truth and his passion and his purpose and his vision for us to grasp. And so let's continue our study with Elijah and look into his life and, and see where God will take us today as we study the life of Elijah. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for today and the opportunity that we have to gather, whether it's by computer or by television. And so guide us in our, in our conversation and in our study that we will uh, experience you anew and afresh today in a, in a story of a man that many of us have studied before. Maybe something new will come out in these pages. So God, guide us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, or last session, we saw the faith of Elijah. Think about it. He, he left a place because the water dried up and the ravens stopped coming bringing him food. He went to just eight miles away from his enemies, the people who are threatening his life and searching for him, hometown, and met with the lady and her son. And they existed day by day on flour and oil. They knew they were safe and in the faithful care of the Lord of God. Today we're going to look about the language of our heart, which is prayer. Now, let me, and here's some things that I know about prayer. And John 16, 24 basically says, Jesus said we can ask anything in his name and receive it. And in Luke 22, 42, Jesus guarded his own requests in terms of his Father's will, or Paul prayed for removal of the thorn in his flesh and was refused, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 9. Again, Paul assured us that grateful praying about everything was the perfect cure for anxiety, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. James added that we don't get what we ask for when we ask with selfish motives. Many of us know, and if we've studied prayer before, it's complicated. Just imagine omnis not omniscient, omnipotent God of the universe takes, account, takes into account me and my desires. God wants to know, the God of the universe wants to know me, wants to know you personally and intimately, and wants to know what's on your heart and what's on my heart. We may never understand prayer totally. However, we can never do too much of it. So think about for a moment when you were a child. Some of us, it goes back longer than others. But think about it for a moment. What was your favorite prayer? Was it the Lord's Prayer? Was it, now I lay me down to sleep? Was it praying through the 23rd Psalm? Was it one of my favorites? 
God is great. God is good. So I could eat a lot quicker. I'd get it, spit it out real quickly. Sweet. God is great. God's good. Thank you for this food. Amen. Or whatever it was. I've forgotten more than I've remembered. Or is there some other prayer that you remember that just sparks in your memory when you talk about prayer? That just goes, whew, I remember that one. So we're going to look at that today. You see, Elijah's being prepared to be a great man of prayer and faith. Think about it. God told him he had to confront a king about being opposed to God. He had to go into hiding, depend on ravens and a stream, though there was no rain. And then he had to travel 100 miles through rugged terrain and desert to a lady who was about to die and ask her for her last bit that she could consider flour and oil. And then they lived on that every day for a period of time. So let's think about this for the, the purpose of um, Elijah being prepared. God is setting up an obstacle course to grow him. Think about it. Confront the king with boldness. Check. Provide shelter and food while being pursued and hunted. Check. Provide shelter, food, and companionship close to the enemy. Check. All right, so now next, where in the world are we going in the life of Elijah? So we look in 1 Kings chapter 17, starting in verse 17. Sometime later, so they, Elijah had been with the lady and her son for a period of time. The son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, and you can hear any mother saying this, what do you have against me, you man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Whew. Tough words to hear. Elijah replied, please give me your son. So he took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying. He laid him out on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God. Have you brought tragedy even on this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let the, this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and, and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child, carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him back to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. The woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. What, what, a, what a picture. What an illustration of anguish, of frustration, of anger, of pleading, and of restoration. You see, many people believe that the tragedy they experience is, a, is directly related to the punishment by God for their sins. That was a very common thread of belief in ancient times and even today. You can see it throughout biblical text. Was this person lame or blind because of the sins of their parents or their family members? Or what sin did this person commit to become lame? You see... Those are all things that have been going on since the beginning of time. That any, any um, tragedy, any misstep was because of past sin. Yes, there are consequences to our sins. But sometimes things just happen. They're not because of sin. And so that's what... Um, so the, the laying on the on the boy in prayer itself to not bring the boy back. You have to understand that. It wasn't what Elijah went through, but it was that God heard his plea and then God restored life back to the boy. And the third thing, the woman's faith increased. This is always God's end game. Think about it. All God wants us to do is become more and more like him or more and more like Christ. 
in doing so, to be that type of person, our faith must increase. So God's end game, no matter what we go through, whether he calls it or not, or, or the circumstances are built up, the end game is to God be the glory, for our faith to grow, for our dependence on him to increase. Lazarus. Think about any of the miracles. All God was doing, woman, you are loved and you are cared for. Think about that for a moment. That's all God was telling to that lady was God. You are loved and cared for. Um, she maybe have taken, we don't know what brought all this on. And I'm not trying to say that the scripture doesn't, it, it, we don't know. But what are some assumptions or some thoughts that we might have about maybe why the reaction happened? The boy got sick. We don't know how the boy got sick. We don't know why the boy got sick. We just know he got sick. People get sick. We know that. People have accidents. It's part of life. But could the woman have gotten so confident, well, I got food every day. I, what do I need about God? Do I really trust this guy staying with me? Is he really, Or is he just using me for a place of shelter and for food every day? I have to cook for him. So all these things could have been going through her mind. And when this happened with her son, she snapped. She snapped. And she, she was angry. I would have been angry. More than likely, you would have been angry. I can't speak for you, but he said, what do you have against me, man of God? So she's, not only is she, she blaming Elijah, she's also blaming God. Think about back in the Garden of Eden. Who did Adam blame? Adam said, it was the woman you put here with me, God. So the man wasn't actually blaming, blaming Eve as much as Adam was blaming God. Same way here. She is not blaming Elijah totally. She's also blaming God. Have we ever done that? Have we ever been in that position? Have we ever blamed God for the misfortune or the mistakes or the circumstances we're in? God, why in the heck did you do this to me? It's your fault, God, not mine. I've tried to do the right thing, but now look at me. So it's got to be somebody else's fault. It can't just be that circumstances happen. It has to be God's fault. And what do you do when, when someone blames you and God for something? Do you get defensive? doesn't sound like Elijah got de defensive. He said, just give me your son. And he took him upstairs. She didn't know what he was doing, but she more than likely as a, as a concerned mother, she was crying and weeping and angry and frustrated and all those kind of things downstairs and this man takes her son upstairs and then God gets then then Elijah gets real how many times do you get real in your prayer time with God do you do you get so or do you come to God all polished with with polished speak with pretty words and all cleaned up in the way you approach God or do you come to God real at times I'm not talking about when someone prays in front of people I'm talking about when you spend your personal time with God. Do you, do you have that? Or do you, God, we just thank you for just such a wonderful day. And uh, we know that you're in control. And, and, and do those kind of prayers when it's just you and God? Or are you real? Are you honest? Because God knows what's going on. And that's what Elijah did. He cried out to the Lord. It didn't say he, he said, hey, God, you know what? What's going on? He said, no, he cried out to God. Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this wind widow I'm staying with and causing her son to die? He was heartbroken. He was desperate. He was seeking God at this moment. And then he stretched himself out on the body, and maybe that was to help warm up his body if it had gotten colder or, or something. To And then he pleaded three times, and three is a, is a holy number, the Trinity and uh, different things. And let it's a completion three's a, a, a three times is completion holy holy or holiest um it's a it's a term of completion and so lord my god let this boy's life return to him and he said it three times and it happened and then she was able to present the son back to the mom 
And so the mom said, she has more proof. She now has full confidence because she might have been a little hesitant over here. You know, there have been other people who have come through the, her town probably that have performed magical signs. She didn't know if he was going out in the middle of the night and stealing flour and oil from somebody else. Maybe, but now she knows because she said it herself. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. So let's think about a few things that we learn from uh, this passage of Scripture. I may have highlighted them as I talk, but let's, let's bring them into a concise format here over the next few moments as we continue in this. God was simply growing Elijah's faith and trust in him to prepare Elijah for the greatest encounter with evil. In other words, God prepares us a little bit at a time because we know if we've read the story of Elijah, what's going to happen on on the mount where he meets with 400 prophets and they try to see which whose God will, will accept the sacrifice. Would Elijah have been able to do that if he hadn't have grown in his faith and dependence on God over these years, over these different circumstances? One was to depend totally on food and water and protection. One was continued food and water, but also how much do you really depend on me because I'm the sustainer of life. And so, you know, many other prophets went through some type of process. Think about Moses. He had to go through a process to be such a great leader. So Elijah's faith was getting stronger and stronger by going through different events and circumstances and situations. Just like with you and I. If our faith remains the way it was and our dependence on God remains the way it was, from earlier life, we've not grown in our faith. Just think, could we have handled some of the things that we may be handling today 30 years ago in our faith journey or 10 years ago in our faith journey? We might have had a totally different pers perspective or outlook on each of those circumstances. All right, so principle number one, God prepares us for the big challenges in life by providing us with opportunities to face the smaller challenges victoriously. In other words, Let's just put it in a different illustration. You always hear, how do you eat an elephant? Because it seems so big and enormous. You do it one bite at a time, right? Well, that's the way it is in life. We do it one event, one circumstance, one day, one hour, one second at a time to get through things. A lot of times when we face tough situations, we become overwhelmed with the enormity of it. But if we can just tackle it a little bit at a time, deal with a little bit of it at a time, we will, we will get through it and we will grow stronger because of it. Think about it. Each challenge given to Elijah progressed in the amount of it how it stretched his faith. He had to have boldness to confront. He had to be protected and have food and water. Then he had to be trusting of someone else. In other words, remember he went to a lady that he did not know, and a son that he did not know, or not his son, but her child that he did not know and trust them to not report him to the queen who lived eight miles away. And then this is the greatest one, death, that God has power over life and death. Though we may not want greater obstacles in our lives, God continues to stretch us and grow us and to grow our faith one step at a time. Challenges that we face today once may have seemed huge and be maybe unmanageable. But now they seem manageable. It all means that still greater challenges. And the, and the flip side of this, and why I laugh is, it just means that there's larger mountains to climb out there in our lives. Recently I traveled to um, the Smoky Mountain, not the Smoky Mountain, the Rocky Mountains. I'm in Colorado and and it's just very different, a different environment there. We went in, in the month, early month of June when we went. And, um, you know, in, in Kentucky, you know, in June, it's almost the official day of summer and it's warm and it's in its eight, the 80s, maybe even 90s. Uh, but our elevation here, at least in Campbellsville, somewhere around 700 feet above sea level. So we get to Colorado and we stay in um, 
we fly into Denver, which is considered the Miles High City, and we travel west, and we, we stay in Breckenridge, uh, Colorado, and um, our lodge that we stay in is at the elevation of 9,500 feet, almost two miles above sea level. Second week of June, we've got snow on the ground. <laughs> we have a snow, uh, 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 we have snow one morning. We wake up with three to four inches on the ground. At our elevation, we had to travel over the mountain to go to, to Utah the next day, and we traveled through eight to 10 inches of snow at higher elevations. When you got above 10,000, 10,500 feet, um, you know, our morning consisted of many mornings. Jennifer and I would wake up before the kids, and we would walk into town from our lodge, which is about a half a mile walk. It's not a bad walk, but it was downhill from our lodge to town. My wife loves coffee, so we'd find a coffee shop. She'd get coffee, and uh, we'd walk around town. Nothing's open. It's early. There was a, some foxes in town in a little field that we would go watch. And, um, but then we'd have to walk back up. We'd have to walk back up, <laughs> let me tell you, to our lodge. And that half mile was a lot harder going up than it was going down. You see, so there are bigger challenges that are in front of us. The higher elevation made everything difficult at that point. But God, and so we had to deal with different things during that time. But So challenges that once seemed huge and manageable, we were able to accomplish. Um, I don't know where that story went, but the higher elevation gave a different perspective on life. Air's thinner. You know, at the beginning of the week, we could not have done some of the things we did towards the end of the week. So it was a good thing that we started off small. We need to rest in the knowledge that God prepares us once we one step at a time. It, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen very quickly, but it does happen. Second principle, in the midst of situations beyond our control, we really learn to pray. Think about it. When we go through tough times, then we really understand what prayer is about. And hopefully we translate that even to the good times. You know, the woman washed her son waste away. In her hurt, she blamed Elijah and blamed God. And all Isaac could do was to cry out in anguish to God in prayer. He was heartbroken. A friendship could be shattered. Trust was being broken. And the last thing, God's reputation was on the line. So Elijah cried out honestly from his heart. As I said earlier, sometimes our prayers become too tidy and too routine. God wants to hear from deep within, within us how we feel without being ugly. We need to go heart to heart with God. To go heart to heart with the God of the universe. Heart to heart with the God of creation. The Lord of Lords. The one who knows my name. There's a, I can't remember off the top of my head the um, name for God, but the name for God means the God who knows my name. How incredible is that? The God of the universe is also the same God that knows my name and knows your name. Principle number three. God understands our anxieties, our fears, and our disappointments, and even our other disillusionments. He knew that doubt was sank into the heart of the woman, to the, of the widow. He knew Elijah must have felt lost. And her rejection and guilt that he may have brought on this family. And so what did Elijah do? He prayed all out. What did he say? He said this. Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? And then he said, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. He was passionate. He was to the point. He was, it was from the heart. He prayed all out. Have you ever been tired when you walk out of a prayer session with God that you've just laid yourself out, poured yourself out completely in that experience? That's what Elijah did. You know, sometimes we think we cannot show our emotions to God. We must be cleaned up, polished, and sanitized of all emotion and come to the feet of God in reverence. And we do come to God in the, the spirit of reverence and in the spirit of fe you know, fear and trembling, all in respect. But God wants 
what's going on inside of us. Many times I've prayed with people over the years at the at the steps of the platform or in in my office or when I ran a camp, you know, they wherever. And some people when they pray, God has just come over them so greatly they weep and almost wail. Have you been with people who have done that or have you done that? You've been so honest with God that that's how you communicate. And that's okay. Know that that's okay. Know that God wants that part of you to be so honest and open with Him that you're holding nothing back. It's okay to be exhausted after a prayer session. It's okay. Principle number four. God is particularly responsive to our prayers when we are able to get beyond our own interests. Did you hear that? To get beyond ourselves and concerns and focus on the needs of others or at our best moments on His reputation. You see, the, the lady was putting God's reputation on the line here, challenging his reputation of who he was. Elijah wasn't going to have any of that, but he had to get beyond himself. He had to get beyond his own pride of being blamed for this. He had to be get beyond himself about looking at the life of this lady's son and her and restoring them to relationship with God. But also, she challenged the authority and reputation of God himself. And uh, We're going to have to go farther than that. Elijah was not concerned for himself at this time. It doesn't seem like from the passage. He said, give me the boy. He goes up and everything was about the boy and her mom, his mom. The belief of the woman, the reputation of God. We must focus on the needs of others and our prayers. So let's take a few moments to examine ourselves so I'm going to ask you a few questions. I'm not going to give you much time to, to think because dead air time is not a good thing. But let, here's some questions. About what issues in your life do you think you need to pray with more emotion and intensity? How would your prayer change or your praying change if you focus more on the needs of others and on God's reputation than on yourself and your own personal needs? How have you grown in your ability to handle larger faith and prayer challenges through your experience with smaller ones? And then what have you learned about prayer during these situations beyond your control? Prayer is such a powerful gift we've been given. It's our communication with the Holy God, with the God of the universe. And it's a privilege and an honor to be able to do that. And it's also a responsibility for us to do that. And so think through that for a moment. Think about those questions as you ponder your own prayer life. God, we thank you for today and the ability that we have to come to you in prayer and to be open and to be honest, be forthcoming. And God, in our prayers, help us not just to focus on ourselves, but focus on others. And God, may we live our lives in a way that we do not destroy your reputation, that we do not cause doubt in others about your reputation, about who you are. In our prayer time, God, may we openly and honestly with you confess those times, but also ask for strength in those times. Because, God, the worst thing we can do is try to damage, intentionally or unintentionally, your reputation as God of the universe, the God of creation, our Father, our life giver, but also the God who knows each one of our names and wants to be that intimate with each and every one of us, of His children. So God, we ask all this and we desire this and may we live according to this. In Jesus' name, amen. So I hope your prayer life continues to grow as you face challenges or as you um, think through things yourself. But we want to hear from you because you may be struggling with something now that we have discussed today about your prayer life or that God has speak to you about something you want to talk to someone. Please feel free to communicate with us at Campbellsville Baptist Church. You can call us at 270-465-8115. You can ask for any of the pastors on staff. We'd love to hear from you, love to talk with you. I'd love to pray with you even over the phone if that's how it is. Or if you would rather do that through email or something, go to our church website. You can also learn more about us on our church website at camelsvillebaptistchurch.com. Go to the About section. You'll find our staff. 
Um, and then you can email one of us if you like or call us. Uh, also, love to have you worship with us. If you want to do that through the internet, we're live every Sunday morning, 1030. Either come to our website, CampbellsvilleBaptistChurch.com, or go to our Facebook page and hit the live button and you'll join us. May God bless you on your journey.